so I'm going to talk about social networks and some of their economic consequences. And I think uh, I'm a, just in, in terms of background, I'm a economist trained in game theory, and uh, I do a lot of work in graph theory and in networks. And I will talk about some of my research and give you some idea of, of the types of tools we look use and the kinds of questions we're asking. And I'm going to start by just a simple exercise. And what I'm going to do is show you a high school. And I'm going to show you a high school of 255 students. And I'm going to show you the friendships inside that high school. And I'm going to do two different versions of it. One is a computer generated fictional high school. And the other is a real high school. And I want to sort of show you what the differences are between those. And so here's a picture of a high school. This is the computer generated one. And there, each little dot here is a student. And there's a link between two dots if those people are friends with each other. So they're doing at least three activities in, in a given week. And this network looks kind of like a spaghetti bowl. It's just a, a bit of a, of a mess. And it's generated by taking the same number of students and the same number of friendships that exist in the real high school and just putting them down completely uniformly at random. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the real high school. And the question is, what kinds of differences do you see between this picture and the previous picture? And one thing that you can begin to notice is that the high school is sort of segmented into two different groups who have most of their relationships inside those groups and fewer relationships across those groups. So it's a heavily segregated high school. And you also notice that there's more inequality in the relationships here. So there are some people who are very well connected and have lots of friends and some people who have very few friends. And in particular, this, this network was drawn by what's known as a spring algorithm. So what it does is in the computer looks at the, the network and it picks two, two people at random. And if they're friends, it moves them closer together on the picture. And if they're not friends, it moves them further apart. And it did, did this 10,000 times and that sort of uncovers the, the structure of the network. And in particular, what I'm gonna do now, so if you, if you look here, you're seeing the segregation, you're seeing more asymmetry. Now what I'm gonna do is, is color code this. So this, High school is actually from the Ad Health data set from a study I did with Sergio Cuaroni and Paulo Pin about a decade ago. Um, the figure is actually from a book I wrote last year called The Human Network. And what these nodes are, they're color coded now. The people are color coded by self reported race. So out of this high school, um, there were three main ethnicities here there were blacks, Hispanics, and whites. And so the blue nodes are blacks, the yellow nodes are whites and the red nodes are Hispanic. And you can begin to see that the segregation pattern here is due to the fact that the, um, there's very, very few friendships between blacks and whites in this high school, even though it's a fairly integrated high school in terms of the overall balance in that school. Okay, And these kinds of structures, here it, it, the Hispanics are actually a fairly small subset of the school. And so they end up being fairly well integrated. So generally, when you look at across this data set, there's 84 high schools for which we have um, good data. Within those high schools, you tend to see the students who are very small minority groups integrate well, but then larger groups will tend to split um, apart. Okay, so what, what's the, the point of this? The point of this is to say that when we look at social networks, they have identifiable characteristics they tend to look different from networks that you would put down purely at random. You see structures to them, you can identify those structures and those structures have consequences. So if we wanna understand how job information flows in a society, um, people tell their friends about opportunities, they recommend their friends for jobs, they recommend their friends for, for, for um, internships, things like that. Um, so these things make a, a difference and they make a difference in information flow and in norms of behavior they make a difference in contagion and diffusion. Um, so, so there's a lot of consequences here. And also these networks are shaped by markets, institutions, platforms, and so forth. And so a, a lot of what I do is study both what, what shapes these things take and what the implications are for, for the society. And so in just terms of, of what I'll talk about this evening, 
I'll, I'll spend time talking about two different things. Um, the first is I'll just give you an example of some of the field work we've been doing and the kinds of questions that we're able to answer that way. And it'll look at how diffusion on networks impacts a market. And then I'll talk about competing trends that we're seeing in the world today. Um, one is that technology is making it easier for people to be connected to more people at greater distances. Um, so for instance, we can be connected this evening with many people um, interacting, but it, it's also increasing the ways in which people self separate themselves and are segregated. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end and, and some of the consequences uh, from that. Okay, so I'm gonna start by just talking about um, some work I've been doing for I guess almost 15 years now with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. And uh, what we, we did was we started in looking at how microfinance was um, being spread, information about microfinance and its participation was being spread in Southern India. And in particular, um, how microcredit was getting into very poor villages. And uh, one important aspect of that was trying to get word out about a new microfinance um, a program. And they were doing that by word of mouth. And so networks will help us understand how information spread in those villages and how participation in this microfinance um, program eventually uh, took place. So just in terms of, of background, um, microfinance, so these are relatively poor villages in uh, Karnataka. The average per capita income is about one to $2 a day. Um, and so these are areas where people don't have much money, they don't have availability of, of money. And so um, there was a bank going into this village and trying to offer loans to people. So the idea was, look, we can come in and give you loans and um, these will help your, your life. It'll enable you to make investments. It'll enable you to, you know, to save income from month to month um, to help spread out your consumption and so forth. So it was very valuable to people, but they needed to get information out to the people in the society. And in these places, there's not an easy way to advertise. So the way they were doing it is spreading by word of mouth. They would go into a village and they would tell people, look, we're here, we're gonna offer some loans, tell your friends about it, we'll be back in a couple of weeks and um, can you know, start offering loans, but, but encourage people to come. And what was happening is um, they were you know, going into a bunch of different villages and these villages were very similar to each other and yet when they told some, you know, they would go into some villages, tell a few people and say, spread the news, they would get um, some places near zero participation and other places they'd get almost half of the population to participate. So they're getting huge variation in, in whether or not information was getting out and whether people were participating. And so what we we're trying to do was go in and understand how the structure of the networks in the village and who they talk to could help us explain and predict whether or not they were going to get um, information to spread out in these villages and get people to participate in these loan programs. Okay. So um, we're looking at 75 villages in Karnataka, and these were relatively isolated from microfinance or, or availability of any kind of loan beforehand. And then a bank came in and in, into 43 of these 75 villages, and offered microfinance loans. And um, today I'm gonna to look at those, I'll show you um, information from those 43 villages and what happened. Okay, so here we are. Um, Karnataka is in Southern India. It's an area that the place we were in was an area in about a hundred kilometer band around uh, Bangalore. And this is a picture of one of the villages. So these are relatively poor villages, um, you know, some agriculture, uh, some sericulture, so raising of silkworms, other kinds of things. Um, here's another picture of a village. So you can see that the, you know, the, the um, villagers are, are, are reasonably poor. Um, and what we did is we went into a village and we mapped out networks. And so what we wanted to do is find out who was in communication with whom and, and how they interacted. And so we had teams of, of 
uh, people go into the villages and basically survey um, people, uh, all the adults and, and households we went into. Um, we have different participation rates, but uh, let me sort of show you what the kinds of questions we asked were. So in this particular village, each one of these little teeny dots is an adult and the clumps of dots are a household. And so in, in these villages, there'll be several generations of people living together in a household. So you might have, you know, anywhere from two to, to 10 adults um, living in a given household. And then this is the answer to a question. If you had to borrow 60 rupees or 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to? And so then they could point at somebody. So that's about, you know, if you, if you had to borrow a dollar, um, who would you go to? And so uh, there's an, a link, an arrow from one person to another if that person answered, this is one of my friends that I could borrow money from, okay? So we have a, a borrowing network. Um, we also have a temple network. So who would you normally go to temple to pray with? Um, this is the advice network. Uh, who would you go to to, to ask for advice? Um, there's a, a kerosene borrowing network. So kerosene is used for heating and cooking and so if, if you run out of kerosene, uh, who would you go to or who would come to you to borrow kerosene uh, and rice? Um, who do you go to in an emergency for medical help? So we have a whole series of different networks. And from those, we can figure out which households are in contact with which other households. So a, a typical village here is about 200 people, 200 households, sorry. Uh, about a thousand people, roughly 200 households. And each household will tend to be connected in these ways to about 15 other households. Okay, so that would be a typical village. And um, one thing that we'll see in these households is we, in, in these networks, we'll see a segregation pattern emerge. And here, what I've done is taken um, one of the villages, this is village 26. And now, um, instead of showing all the adults, I'll just show you the household. So each one of these dots is now a household, aggregated into the household. And this is the kerosene and rice um, lending network. So there's a link between two households if they borrow and lend kerosene and rice to each other, with each other. Okay. Now, the key thing in this um, network is now these are color-coded. And they're color-coded by race. So in particular... In, the, in these villages, um, here we've got the blue are the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So those are the relatively disadvantaged castes. And the general and otherwise backward castes are the red. Those are the relatively advantaged castes. Okay. And then up here you can see these, the frequency of links are about 9%. So if you pick two households within the same caste designation, there's about a 9% chance that they are linked to each other. Whereas if you pick um, across these casts, then there's only about a six tenths of a percent chance. So it's about 15 times more likely that these households are interacting if they're within the same cast group, okay? So you see heavy segregation patterns. And actually here you can you see also just among the blue nodes, you can see that there's a split almost down the middle where the blue nodes on the left don't interact much with the blue nodes on the right. So there's additional splits within this graph, even within these cast groups, within the scheduled cast and scheduled tribes. Okay, so we have these villages, that we have the networks, and what would happen is now a bank comes into one of these villages and says, look, we wanna get information out about microfinance. We wanna make sure that people are gonna go out and get information about loans and come and participate in our program. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell people in this village. So we'll tell a few people and ask them to spread information to their friends. Now, if you begin to look at this network, if they happen to pick a node way out here, say on the, the you know, far left, um, it's possible that that person wouldn't end up telling many people, right? So they would end up hitting somebody who wasn't very central. In contrast, if they hit somebody in the middle of the graph who has lots of friends and is well connected into the graph, it's possible that they would get more information spread. And so what we wanted to do is track to what extent 
um, who they were talking to initially made a big difference in how the information spread through this network and, and what the eventual participation was, okay? And the way that the bank did this is they said, okay, look, we wanna hit highly central people. Who are the people that are likely to know a lot of other people in a network? Well, they figured teachers would know a lot of people, shopkeepers, and then um, what are known as self-help group leaders. So they have these groups that, that are of people that get together and help each other, and there's leaders in those groups. So they would go into a village and look for these people and say, okay, look, we're going to tell them we're coming in, we're going to offer loans, tell everybody in your village about it, and then they could see how many people showed up. Okay. So in terms of this information passing, then the question is, does it really matter who they, who they talk to initially? Right, so does it really matter if you want to get a product out there in the world? Um, is it enough just to hit a couple people and then will it spread, or do you have to hit the right people? And the second question is, okay, if we have to hit the right people, how should we measure who's the central person? Um, you know, what's the right way to figure out who's really most central and well connected in the network? And Hitting the right nodes is very important. And it's a subject that goes back to actually 1903, Simmel writes about it, but there's a, a long literature of, of papers that have studied this question. And what we're gonna do is, is actually look at that in a particular data set where we're able to see this, okay? And so let me talk a little bit about how we measure who's central in a network. And the, the most obvious way to do that is just count how many people you're linked to. How many friends do you have, right? Or, or you know, if you look on Twitter, how many followers do you have? Um, it, do you look like Katy Perry and have, you know, tens of millions of, of followers or are you somebody who has three followers, right? So, so you know, we're, we're just saying, if you've got more followers, you can just blast that information out and more people are gonna hear about it. So that's the most basic count. And that's what's known as degree centrality. In network parlance, what we do is we count degree. Degree just means how many people do you have that you're connected to. And so here, if you looked at the network on the left, um, obviously the seven person is the, the most central person. On the right is the person with six connections. So you've got you know, just a raw count of that. Okay, well, it turns out degree is a pretty naive way to think about um, centrality in a network. It works for sort of just you know, raw numbers of friends but it, it actually isn't that good for, for predicting what's gonna happen in terms of spreads of things through, throughout a whole society. And let me just sort of point out what, what the problem is. And, and this will get into sort of how we start to use math in these situations and, and um, you know, why math is a very important tool for us to understand how to measure things. So here I've, I've you know, connected this network up and now let's think of there's two different nodes here that are sort of highlighted that have two friends each. It's quite easy to see that the one node that has two friends, the one here in the middle, is in some ways better connected than the other one that's sort of on the edge. And one way to see that is that the person, this two has a connection to a, seven, a person who has seven friends and a person who has six friends. The other one is connected to two twos, right? And there's also a sense in which the one is, you know, on the far right is kind of on the outskirts of the network and the other person is more in the middle of the network. And so there's what, what we'd like to be able to do is quantify that, right? So how do we say that this, that even though these people both have the same number of friends, one of them looks a lot more central than the other. So the, the way in which this is done is what's known as eigenvector centrality. And the idea is, Let's think of the centrality of some person, I'll call this person I. Um, so what's the centrality of person I? Instead of just counting how many friends they have, we're gonna make their centrality proportional to the sum of their friends' centrality. So instead of just giving you a score that says, look, if I have 10 friends and you have two friends, I'm gonna give you a 10 and, and the other person a two. Instead, what we're gonna do is say, what's the centrality of your friends? and you'll get credit for having more central friends, okay? So we'd like the centrality to be proportional to the sum of the centrality of your friends. Okay, what's tricky about this 
what's tricky about this is now that I, I've got centrality is determining centrality, right? So it's self-referential. And so this becomes a system of equations in a system of unknowns. And that's what's known, um, solving this type of set of equations is what's known as finding an eigenvector. And so here, um, the, the solution to this is a well-defined problem. You can prove that there's a unique uh, solution to this, and it, it's known as sort of the principal eigenvector of, of, the, of this set of equations. So this is a well-defined set of equations. There's a solution to it in these kinds of networks, and, and that's what we'll call eigenvector centrality. Okay, so if we go back to this network, um, what we see is that the central node here is about three times higher, uh, has a three times higher connection rate than the, the, the one on the um, periphery according to eigenvector centrality. So we have a, um, a way now of saying, look, this person is much better connected. And in, in fact, the person who has the highest centrality is this six um, friend node uh, in the middle here this 0.5. And so this gives us some idea of how well connected things are in measuring how well connected your friends are. Okay. So um, this is a, a, a centrality measure that actually uh, you may not know it, but you're, you see this quite frequently. This is very closely related to what's known as page rank, which was what is behind the Google search engine. So um, Google, when it first was developed, was developed off an algorithm which was trying to figure out, look, when people type in, you know, suppose you type in, um, I, wanna, I wanna buy an iPhone, and you type in iPhone. Uh, well, there's you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of pages that they could come up with to show you that have the word iPhone on it or have some, some association with iPhone. So the question is, you know, which pages did they want to show you? Well, they, they started to look at the whole system of the web as a giant network and then ranking different pages according to how well connected they were to other pages and how well connected those pages were to other pages and so forth. So it's essentially a very similar calculation to this eigenvector um, centrality. Uh, I won't go into the details, but, but their algorithm was originally built off of this kind of, uh, of system and that enabled it to find the pages that were the best connected and the ones that most people would want to see. And that was the way that they initially went about um, picking out things to show you. Okay, so, so here we have different ways of measuring how well connected people are. And let me show you one third method, which actually turned out to be the right one in, in this particular setting. And we'll call that diffusion centrality. And um, I guess, you know, now with COVID, people are, are unfortunately a lot more aware of how this works. So what this is gonna be based on is a very simple spreading system. So based like a, off of a contagion, um, a very simple contagion system. And what will happen is we'll just ask how many other people in your village, how many other nodes in this network end up knowing about microfinance if we, we start by telling some node, and then what we do is that node bumps into some of its friends randomly, tells them about it, and then they bump into some friends and tell them about it. So we think about this just like the spread of a flu or the spread of COVID. You randomly bump into somebody. If you know it, then they will, can end up knowing it, and then those people can end up spreading it and so forth. So it's just going to move out through the network. So there'll be two parameters here. P is going to be the probability that any particular node who knows about it tells one of its friends. And T is going to be how long we run this process for. So are we going to, is this going to, are people going to keep talking about this? Are they going to talk about it <clears throat> for a week, for a month, you know, for a year? So how long do they keep talking about this? Okay. And so let me just make this concrete, how this would work. So let's so that, say that the bank comes in and this is um, one of the people in the village and it tells us, this person, look, we're a bank, we're coming in to offer loans, tell your friends. And let's suppose that on average, they tell, people tell their, talk to their friends about half the time in a given day, and this process la lasts for four days. So the first day, this person randomly bumps into some of its friends with a probability of a point half, maybe it bumps into one of them. So now this person knows about microfinance. It tells them, look, um, I just heard that there's a bank coming into town. They're going to offer us loans. 
um, you should come to the meeting. Now there's two people who know, and uh, we're on day two now. So then this person happens to tell some people. This initial node tells another person. And then the process continues. Now we've got um, five people informed. They can tell friends, right? And so this is just like a contagion process. So this is literally the way that, that um, epidemiologists model contagion processes. Uh, and so here, after a few periods, after four periods with this probability, you end up, if you'd simulated this, you'd end up with this node having thir told 13 people, okay? And we could just keep simulating this given we know the network and see how many people would end up knowing about this if we started with some particular node informed. Okay, let's suppose it was this node instead. What would happen then? Well, they would tell somebody, second period to tell somebody, third, fourth, they get six. So this node is in some sense a little less than half as well connected as the other node. So the, the first node we looked at had 13, this one gets a six. So the scores are, are better for the, for the first node, okay? So when we look at this diffusion centrality, um, it depends on sort of how long you run this and what this probability looks like. But what happens is if communication occurs just once, so if people can only talk once, then all that matters is how many immediate friends you have because you're not gonna have a chance for anything to go further. So then it literally looks like degree centrality. We just count up the number of your friends. People with more friends are gonna do more spreading if it's just one, one time. But if this happens repeatedly, if T becomes large, it turns out that then this starts to look like eigenvector centrality. So you can view these different method, um, ways of looking at centrality on the one extreme, just counting your immediate friends is like a process that spreads once and then just dies. And you just wanna figure out how many friends somebody has. And eigenvector centrality looks like a process that just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading forever and just bouncing around the network. And diffusion centrality is somewhere in between, okay? And so if you go into these villages, what you can do is then look across these 43 different villages in some villages, they were getting almost no participation. In other villages, they were getting much participation. And we know who they talk to in these different villages. And so you can look at how well can you predict how well they were gonna do in each of these village based on just village characteristics. So some villages have smaller networks, some of them have bigger networks, some of them have denser networks and so forth. So just by looking at the villages, you can say things are gonna spread more on this village than in this village. Then you can say, okay, let's take into account how degree central the people they talked to were. You get a little bit more explanation, about 30% of, of the variation you see across villages, you can explain by adding that. Um, eigenvector centrality, you get up a little teeny bit higher, but diffusion centrality, you get much higher. And in fact, if you estimate the P and the T from this, you can get this up to about 63%, 62, 63%. So you can more than double how much explanatory power you look at by just looking at who they talk to and knowing how central these people are in a very well-defined way off a mathematical model that tries to understand how things spread in a network, okay? So, so these kinds of models are very useful, not only in in understanding epidemics, understanding what goes viral, and understanding different kinds of things, but also in understanding spread of information about a, a, a particular loan program, um, it begins to be important in understanding the economics in these settings. And so, you know, that's the reason an economist would be interested in this. Okay, so, so that was just one example to, to give you some feeling for the kinds of tools that we use, the kinds of models we're using, the kinds of data we're gathering, the kinds of questions we're asking. Um, you know, ultimately we wanna understand how does this impact people's lives? So the, you know, the purpose of this is to, to understand that. And what I wanna do in the, the, you know, the remaining time in, in terms of going through this is give you just some other understandings of some things about networks, what, what kinds of things we know about networks and in particular, um, competing trends that we're seeing in the world today. And uh, one is we're seeing increasing density and in interactions. So we see you know, um, a much denser world than, than we used to have. 
So just to, to give you one example of this, if you look at the um, uh, plague in the uh, 14th century, if you look at the, the Black Death, it took four years to spread from Marseille to Stockholm. So the network was very spread out, very thin at those at, in those particular times, very local to the geography. And it took a long time for a disease to move um, you know, a, a, across a, a continent. Uh, if you look at Ebola, um, it actually takes you know, a matter of, of days or weeks to get from one part of the world to another, or the measles, it could even take um, you know, hours literally uh, for it to, to move partway across the globe. So, you know, when you have a more connected world, um, these things can, can be spreading much more. And so we see increasing density, increasing globalization, more connections across the world. And at the same time, another thing we're seeing is increasing divisions within the network. And what uh, sociologists have called homophily. And what homophily refers to is people tend to interact mostly with other people who are similar to themselves. So that your friends tend to have very similar characteristics to yourself. And that's a, a growing trend. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these two trends in, in sequence. And let me start out by, by just showing you some pictures of networks over time. And in order to do this, I'm going to show you um, some work from a study I did with Stephen Nye about five years ago. And uh, it's very hard to find networks that go back a long time in time. And so what I'm going to do is show you um, data um, now nodes are countries, and um, each little dot here, you know, so for instance, this is Russia, um, and there's this Austria-Hungary. Um, so we've got different countries, and there's a link between two countries if those two countries had a treaty with each other, okay, some sort of, of treaty, written treaty. And this is right after the Napoleonic Wars, so it was started in 1815. And I'm just going to take you through decade by decade how this network evolved, and we'll see what it looks like over time. Okay, so we'll start in 1815, and I just want you to sort of look at the network and see how is it changing over time. So we started with it in 1815. Here we get 1825, um, 1835, 1845. 1855, 65. So it's sort of bouncing around a bit. You see 1870s, it sort of disintegrated. Um, 1880s, it's bouncing around a bit. 1890s, 1900s. So you know, the network is just sort of moving around. Um, 1930s, 40s. Then we get into the 50s and it starts to become much denser. And it's going to gradually densify um, through the decades, 80s, 90s, 2000, we see a much, much denser network by the time we get to um, 2000 than what we saw initially. And you can you know, look at positions of different countries. So if you want to understand international trade and so forth, you can look at the positions of different countries. So USA has very different trading partners than France does. Um, Canada sits in a different position. Saudi Arabia, here's China, Russia. Um, so there's these different treaties among different countries and you can begin to understand a lot about the, the world politics and um, economics by looking at these networks. And one thing I, I want to sort of emphasize is if you look before World War II, countries on average had about two and a half allies. And there was a two thirds chance that they would still have a treaty with that country five years after you looked at that. So if you look at one point in time and then ask what's the chance that these countries are still connected to each other five years later, it's about a two thirds chance. So there weren't many connections and they were highly volatile. Post World War II, you get about 10 and a half allies and about a 95% chance that they last five years. So it becomes a much denser network and it's much, it lasts um, much longer. The relationships that are there are much steadier. Okay. And let, let me give you an idea of, of how we understand this network and what predicts it. Um, what really predicts it is there's a takeoff of world trade after the Second World War. So starting in, in the 1950s, you just see a, a steady growth in the percentage of GDP that's traded around the world. And now um, countries routinely 
import and about import and export about 30% of their um, net GDP. So you see about a 60% overall trade percentage in terms of world GDP. So what this means is countries are much more integrated to each other. And that means that you have more steady relationships. So if you're trading back and forth goods with another country, you have an interest in, in having a relationship with them. The interesting impact of this is that the number of wars that you see between countries has dropped dramatically as a result of this. So if you look at the incidence of wars, this is um, from what's known as the correlates of war data set. And it's looking at wars between pairs of countries. So just pick randomly two countries in the world, ask, are they at war with each other? And look at that across history. And again, starting just after the Napoleonic Wars, what you see is that you know, it's a, a highly volatile world where some there were periods where there was a lot of countries at war, then things would get peaceful for a while, then they would uh, you know, resurge, you'd get war again. And the interesting thing is post-1950, wars pretty much disappear by historical standards. So there's a, right now there's about one-tenth as many wars per pairs of countries as there have been throughout history. So we're living in by far the most peaceful period that the world's ever seen. And um, these global effects come back from this network where we see increased trade, increased alliances, and decreased conflict. And so we use different methods to try and understand the timing of this and how the network evolves. And one thing you begin to see is that the trade networks and the conflict networks are closely related to each other. And basically, if, if um, two countries trade a lot with each other, they never go to war with each other. It, it, it pretty much... So once you hit a threshold of trade, wars tend to disappear. And um, so you begin to see a situation where, uh, you know, this increased density across the world has actually led to the most peaceful period um, that the world's ever known. Now, obviously, conflict hasn't completely disappeared, and there's still a, a good number of civil wars throughout the world. But by historical standards, we're actually living in the most peaceful period the world's ever known. Um, what comes along with this, what comes along with this is, you know, increased exposure to financial shocks. So, you know, um, a subprime mortgage catastrophe in the United States ends up having an impact in the Spanish economy. Um, and, and so, you know, in 2008, we end up seeing um, things move around the world in terms of financial contagion. Um, disease is a, more, you know, the Black Plague took four years to get from Marseille to, to, to Stockholm. Um, but you know, diseases move much, much more quickly. So there's great benefits from having this more connected world, but also um, costs associated with it. And the last thing I wanna talk about then is one other thing that comes along with this is we, we see a denser, more connected world, but in some ways we're also seeing a more fragmented world. And I'll just show you some pictures. You know, we've seen some of these already, right? We saw um, a high school, we saw the kinds of splits that you see within a high school in terms of friendships. Uh, we see here, uh, the, you know, the caste network. So we see heavy divisions in these networks by different um, character, demographic characteristics, caste, uh, ethnicity, you see it by age, you see it by gender, you see it by profession, religion, education levels, income levels. So, you know, pretty much any demographic you look at, you'll see cuts in the network along those dimensions. And one, you know, there's been talk about the world becoming more polarized in terms of politics. Let me show you some, uh, just one uh, fun network that, that looks at this. And what this is, is the US Senate. And we're gonna start by looking at what the Senate looked like in 1990. And the nodes are color coded by um, Democrat and Republican Party. And in particular, what, so each one of these people is a senator. They're, the names are, are on there on the screen. And this is code I got from uh, Renzo Lucioni. And then I just ran it on uh, Senate co-voting. And what happens here is there's a link between two nodes if they voted the same on at least half of the votes that came before the Senate. So you've got the Senate bringing up a bunch of votes. Um, if we vote more often the same way than against each other, then we'll, we'll put a link between them and say, okay, these, these two people are somehow 
um, agreeing more than they're disagreeing. And so this again is drawn by a spring algorithm that tries to you know, pull people together if they're um, you know, voting the same way and pull them apart if they're voting differently. And it, it does a, you know, the, for the most part, it, it separates along party lines. So you see blues on the left, um, the reds on the right. Um, there's a few people who are a little different. So there's a Republican Wilson, Republican from California that ends up on the left side. Um, you know, a, a, a Democrat from uh, um, <clears throat> from Hawaii that ends up a little bit on the right side. Um, so you know, there's there's different patterns here, but this it's a fairly cohesive network. So 82% of the senators are linked. Okay. Now let's go to 2015. So actually, before the 2016 election, and this thing just splits apart, right? So now you've got a heavily split network where only 53% of the um, senators are, are voting the same way, and most of those are within party. So um, you know, they tend to be um, almost always within party. And you can find you know, McConnell's fairly central in the Republican Party. Feinstein is over here on the um, Democrat Party. You can look at different people. Lindsey Graham sort of pulls out. Rubio and Cruz are a little bit extreme on the Republican Party. Um, but what you end up with is a, ver a much more fractured network than you used to see. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, and, and actually I spend a lot of time in this book, The Human Network, talking about what's, what are some of the forces that are pushing in this. And there's different economic forces, but there's also network forces that are at work. And let me show you a, a couple of the network forces that are at work. So um, this is uh, from a study by um, three people from Facebook. And what they're doing is they classify people into conservative or liberal um, uh, political ideology. And then they looked at uh, how much content they would see on their feeds from across, uh, across the aisle. So if you were liberal, how much conservative stuff would you see? If you're a conservative, how much liberal stuff would you see? Okay. And they first started out by, by seeing, okay, how much would you see if stuff was shown just completely at random? rather than shown the way it comes through your feed. And what tends to happen is then, you know, in this case, about 40% of the material was from conservative sources and about 45% from liberal. So you'd see a little more liberal than conservative, uh, or sorry, um, it's cross-cutting. So you'd see a little more of the, of the opposite. Um, but what happens is when you actually look at the potential from the network, there's a much lower potential and why is it a lower potential? It's because if you're liberal, most of your friends are liberal. And so you're not going to see, see as much stuff posted by conservatives. And if you're conservative, most of your friends are going to be conservative and you're not going to see as much stuff posted from the, from the other side. So you, in terms of the network, just if you were looking there from that, you would see a lower percentage. And then what you're actually exposed to in terms of what they post is lower. And then you can look at what they click on and that's even lower. So you go through this selection where the network segregates itself, and then what is actually being shown by the algorithms is selected a bit more, and then what people are actually viewing once they have an option um, is even more selective. So this idea of echo chambers can sort of play itself out where uh, you know, the different side, conservatives and liberals will be seeing very different um, sources of information. Okay, um, last, uh, sort of uh, graph here just to show you one other thing that's going on, um, how people met. So this is a graph of uh, how couples met and there's going back to the 1940s and then through, through 2018, basically. Um, this is from a study by Mark Rosenfeld as a sociologist at Stanford. And one thing you notice is people used to meet via family, via friends, via school. And now there's more and more meeting online more and more meeting in, in um, social places and bars. And so that gives you a very different dynamic. Uh, when you meet online, you can actually look for people that have certain selected characteristics. You can make choices and, and sort of sort through things. And so that can lead to more segregated networks. So in terms of technological ch challenges, you know, platforms benefit from engagement. They compete with each other. These algorithms are built to reinforce the network, um, offer things that people like, offer news that resonates, um, connect you with people that look like you, and this can actually exacerbate the homophily. Uh, 
So, you know, we can become more connected and more segregated at the same time. So networks matter. Um, you know, there's a lot of inner dynamics and feedbacks between these platforms and so forth. Technology mediates a lot of our interactions and we need a lot more understanding of how these networks affect how we act, what we know, when we know it, and also how the technology is affecting our interactions and the structure of those interactions. So these interactions matter and, and we can begin to study these in systematic and, and methodologically sound ways. Um, you know, I, I have a, a couple of books I've written on this. So the Human Network's more recent one that's sort of a, a general audience book and then social and economic networks is a much more technical mathematical text um, that sort of builds up the foundations for doing research in this, in this area. Um, but thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take questions and sort of open up broad discussion about anything you'd like to talk about. Okay, so that's the end of like the formal lecture. If you have any questions, please send them to me through a direct message. I have a few picked out right now, but there's always room for more. And while I'm waiting for the questions, let's just start with the first one. So are three-dimensional representations ever used for centrality? Is there any use for having a three-dimensional quote unquote web? Um, yes, certainly. So, uh, you know, actually the, the more dimensions you could view something in, in some ways, the, the, the better resolution you get because once you sort of force things just to be on a flat plane, you're, you're, you're losing some of the um, uh, structure of these different groups and the patterns that you can see. Um, the difficulty obviously is just representations of those in three dimensions. So there are some programs that do pretty good three-dimensional visual, visualizations and you can begin to look at the network and spin it around. And, and uh, it, there's a small industry of different techniques for drawing networks and representing them. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty important aspect of doing some of the research because it gives you a feeling for how split up the networks are, how many different groups they are, there are, what dimensions they split on and so forth. And then also you know, tracking them over time. But teaching a computer how to figure out the best way to show you a network, it's not an easy thing to do. So, so there's a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to figure out what's the best algorithm for doing this. And, there is a lot of stuff that's done in 3D now. Okay. Um, in, the graph, in the graph with trade, it seemed as if the networks were fairly small compared with to those of Russia. Does that mean that Russia had more connections than the US? Um, uh, this question is kind of weirdly worded, okay. but I think like the networks refers to like the networks connected to the United States. Yeah, so, so um, there's just sort of two things going on is that over at, at different points in time, there were different levels of connectedness. Uh, the other is that, that sometimes there's allies that you, you actually trade with quite a bit, but aren't, aren't formalized in terms of um, uh, political treaties. So the U.S. has some partners, trading partners. Um, for instance, it has pretty close relationships with China in terms of trade, the amount of trade that goes on. And yet, um, you know, wouldn't show up as a formal relationship in that in that graph. Uh, the other thing that happened is the Russia came out of the former Soviet Union, and the former Soviet Union fractured into a lot of countries, and all of those countries are still connected via different political treaties. So, um, you know, the, the there's different things that play into the details. I think the the main thing to take away from those graphs, there's a lot of noise in trying to look at at you know, what you quantify as two countries that have treaties and so forth. But the main thing was really just the overall change in density. The world's becoming much more connected. So all countries tend to have more partners than they used to. And those things are really cemented by trade. But there is a lot of measurement error. And I think, you know, that's a, a big challenge in the kind of work that I do is, you know, um, how do you track who's interacting with whom, whether it be a country or a person, so if I wanted to track all your friends, I would need to, to you know, get your social media, your phone, um, you know, all sorts of different ways that you might interact with different people, plus in-person interactions. Uh, if I want to keep track of countries, how do I define what's a real political relationship? How do I define whether they're really trade partners or not? Um, how do I define whether they're enemies? 
um, these things are, you know, it, it, there's a lot of measurement questions. So it's, it, it takes a lot of thought. Okay. Um, if growth increased after the Second World War, did that mean that countries started exporting and importing more? Or did they have more connections? If they had more connections, does that linearly correlate with the amount of imports slash exports? Um, yeah, so, so both were happening. So the level of imports and exports, uh, you know, typically countries were somewhere in the 5 to 10% range um, before the war, or actually lower than that, so 0 to 10% range. And after the war, um, countries are more in the 20 to 30% range. So a, a dramatic increase in imports and exports. And a big part of that is due to the fact that um, shipping became much cheaper. So the ability for countries to transport goods across the world, both by ship and by air eventually, um, have led to dramatic drops in, in transportation costs and a lot of increase in, in mobility of goods. Also, a uh, financial network has gotten a lot denser, so it's easier to move money around the world. And so you're seeing a lot more trade, and then you're seeing more of these relationships that go on top of it, where you have more trade partners and uh, more political treaties with those trade partners to say, look, we'll protect you if somebody comes to attack you. We have economic interests in you and so forth. And that means that it's, it's much less likely for countries to, to go to war with each other. Um, you know, like if you look at most European countries, historically, they're almost always at war with each other up until, you know, the, the 1950s. Uh, and, and now it's almost unthinkable to, you know, to see them go to war with each other. You do see things moving backwards, you know, things like Brexit, things like the U.S. trade war with China. These are, are steps backwards in, in terms of, you know, the, the densification of this and the benefits it's brought. Um, so you're, you're seeing some retrenchment. Uh, at this point in time. Um, are networks one of the deciding factors in the decrease of conflict? If so, why are there place, why are there wars in places such as the Middle East where there are abundant resources? Yeah, so the Middle East is a fascinating example. So um, for, for, let's take one example. So let's look at Israel and look at the countries around Israel. The, um, I think the only country that you can find that it trades uh, even close to half a percent of its GDP with is Jordan. So out of the countries in the, the rest of the countries in the Middle East, even though you've got fairly advanced economies, you're not seeing much trade between those economies. And so one key to understanding the fact that the Middle East is still a place with a lot of conflict is that there's actually the, the trade that we see that unifies Europe and has unified a lot of um, Asia and, and um, North America with Asia and so forth, are, uh, that, that level of trade hasn't gone into the Middle East. So you know, the top 10 trading partners of Israel are all outside of the Middle East. And, and that kind of pattern means that it's gonna be very difficult to you know, broker a peace. Pieces of paper don't make for peace. You need aligned interests. And those interests often come from, from economic um, structure. And so until you get the trade going, I think, you know, one way to really try and solve peace for the Middle East is not to take a short term thing where we're going to have a bunch of treaties. It's building long term trading relationships to say, okay, look, we got to get these countries trading with each other, we have to get that happening. And until that happens, we're not going to see a, a peaceful situation. Um. How many degrees of connectedness do you consider when determining how connected someone is? So for example, person A knows person B and person B knows person C who knows person D. So the question is like, what is the cutoff point? Yeah, um, you know, a, the, the right cutoff really depends on what, you're, what question you're asking. So for instance, in these villages, um, it turned out that we estimated sort of what that distance was and it was about three hops. So information from one person pretty much could go out three hops. And then after that, it sort of died out. It didn't go much further. Um, but that was particular to the spread of information about loans. It could be that there's other kinds of things where, you know, you need to keep track of this for, for great distances. So if you're looking at something like measles or something else, um, contact tracing, you don't just go out one person. You're going to have to go out a number of people because it's, 
uh, measles are so contagious that it can spread very rapidly and, and a great deal of hops very, very quickly. Um, in, in contrast, if you're you know, just sort of looking at, at um, you know, some kind of um, news bit that might only be of limited interest to a set of people, it might be that you only need to go out one or two hops. So I think it depends very much on the kind of information or the kind of thing that you're thinking about spreading and, and how uh, resilient that thing is and, and how interesting it is uh, in terms of how well it's going to spread through the network. Okay, this will be the last question. Um, is there a large demand for people who are experienced in this field? What industries would people interested apply to? Wow. Uh, yeah, there's a huge demand. Um, it, yeah, definitely. So this is an area where there's increased study of all types and, um, you know, there's a, a lot of demand in the Silicon Valley, for instance, uh, you know, Facebook has a, a good research and data science team, Google hires people, um, Instagram, you know, within uh, Facebook, but you also have um, WeChat, I mean, you, you, you name it and um, around the world, there's a lot of hiring going on in areas that study networks. And also uh, there, there's other, it, you know, it's, it's part of business now. So in business, people that are transacting with other businesses need to have some idea of how safe those other partners are. And that requires knowing who their partners are and, and so forth. So financial institutions are starting to do that. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank, central banks in Europe are starting to track networks to try and understand financial contagions. Um, epidemiologists are starting to track them to understand COVID. Um, so that, you know, the, the, these kinds of tools are becoming ubiquitous and, and something that uh, is used sort of not just in, in economics, but in all kinds of different areas. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think networks are so fundamental to human interaction that it's, it's a very um, promising area for, for study.